Greetings. My name is Fania Davis, and I uh, am making this offering on reimagining Black mental health uh, through a racial and restorative justice lens. I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Chochenyo Ohlone people located here in Oakland, the San Francisco Bay Area. The Ohlone people are asking non-Indigenous uh, people and businesses to pay the Shu'uni annual land tax, which supports the Shogarea Te Land Trust in reclaiming uh, stewardship and um, in uh, restoring ecosystems of their, native, of their native land here. This is March 2021, Women's History Month. And I want to honor and express solidarity with the millions of women of the world who have taken to the streets, even in the midst of a pandemic that deepens inequality and violence around the world. In New Delhi, Mexico City, Caracas, La Paz, Yonde, Kathmandu, Palestine, Jakarta, Tokyo, Rome, and in so many other cities across the globe, women are marching against rape, femicide, political inequality, and structural violence. I also acknowledge the 530,000 souls lost to COVID-19, the souls lost to police terror, the souls lost to climate catastrophe and to the greed of the energy moguls in Texas, souls lost to anti-Asian hate crime. Please take a moment and let's land, ground ourselves here. Feel the bottom of your feet touching the floor and imagine that they are touching the surface of the earth. Hold your spine erect, allowing the earth's energies to rise through your feet and flow from your tailbone up your spine to the crown of your head. Observe any areas of tightness, contracture, discomfort in the body. Notice them, breathe into them, but don't judge or try to fix them. Now go to the center of your chest, breathe into and out of your heart. Breathe to honor and express solidarity with the indigenous people of the land. Breathe in solidarity with the women of the world. Breathe to honor all the souls lost to COVID, to corporate greed, to police violence, to anti-Asian hate. Finally, breathe to take care of yourself, of ourselves, to have compassion for ourselves as we directly or vicariously experience the pressures of COVID-19, police terror, gender violence, and other trauma generating events. Now, uh, open your eyes when you're ready. So, this George Floyd COVID-19 white nationalism run amok economic disaster, climate catastrophe, historical inflection point is a time of heartache. Yet it is also a time of hope. We're seeing that our nation is not born in liberty. The nation was born in the terror, genocide, land theft slavery, the slave trade, heteropatriarchy. After centuries, we're finally seeing that white supremacy pervades and permeates all our institutions and the collective consciousness. All our social structures, all our relationships have been 
debased, defiled. Nothing has been left. Nothing has been left untouched. And so this is a time of awakening from a long slumber of collective denial about our collective biography. It is also a time of releasing the old, envisioning the new, releasing policing institutions that systematically subjugate and brutalize Black people. A time of imagining new public safety futures where Black lives finally matter. This re-envisioning work is happening all over the nation. For example, Oakland is transferring 50% of its police budget to fund social services and communities that can more safely and effectively respond to 991 mental health calls. Also, Oakland schools have removed a police from, um, have removed police matter and are replacing them with peace ambassadors and restorative justice practitioners and counselors. Of course, this stunning victory was brought about by millions marching in the streets in the largest ever demonstrations in world history, Black Lives Matter demonstrations this past summer. The remove uh, school police victory also resulted from tens of thousands of youth students marching here in the streets of Oakland last summer. But this historical moment goes beyond imagining new public safety futures. This is also a time of envisioning new education, economic health futures, including mental health futures, where Black lives will finally matter. All over the country, I see so many agencies and institutions and uh, including education institutions and uh, public agencies and um, community organizations, reinventing themselves, wholeheartedly dedicating themselves to becoming anti-racist institutions. And so this reimagining Black Mental Health Conference today, this month is timely, timely rather. And I want to acknowledge our joy for convening it. When we look at the current state of mental health in the nation, it is abundantly clear that Black lives don't matter. Issues at the intersections of Black mental health, the criminal injustice system, and policing have never been more acute. Prisons house more mentally ill individuals than all of the nation's psychiatric hospitals combined. Police have become the default responders to mental health calls. Jails and prisons are the largest purveyors of mental health services in the country. You have to go to jail to get mental health services in our nation. This is shameful. Prison health services are at best incompetent, at worst abusive. Black and people of color are disproportionately impacted. Once ensnared in our criminal justice system, persons experiencing mental health crises are victimized in multiple ways. They are more likely to confess, resulting in wrongful convictions, more likely to be abused and sexually assaulted. Once released, more likely to be victims of violent crime. Treating our most vulnerable citizens in this way is unimaginably cruel. It is a crime against humanity. So the takeaway here is that we simply cannot reimagine Black mental health without reimagining mass incarceration and reimagining our criminal injustice system. 
We need Black mental health futures, new Black mental health futures, new criminal justice futures, new public safety futures. They all go hand in hand. There is not only a tight nexus between Black mental health and racialized mass incarceration, there is a close connection between Black mental health and police terror. Approximately 25% of fatal police shooting, shootings involve persons with signs of mental illness, 25%. Deadly shootings involve disproportionately higher percentages of Black mentally ill individuals, of course, Sandra Bland, Tony McDade, Alfred Olongo, Eric Garner, and countless others. Mental health is criminalized. It is a crime in this country to have mental health issues, especially if you're Black, poor, or homeless. Police have become the default responders, rather, to mental health crises. We criminalize our most helpless and vulnerable instead of wrapping our arms around them and caring for them. So we cannot reimagine Black mental health without also confronting police killings and reimagining how we ensure public safety again. Broadening our scope. Serious Black mental health challenges today also arise from the effects of COVID-19 and the vicarious trauma of witnessing police terror. COVID-19 threatens income, it threatens housing, it threatens food on the table, it threatens basic necessities. These stressors contribute to the rise in mental health and substance abuse issues, the spiking in these issues that we are seeing today have devastated the Black community. Police killings of unarmed Black people is a serious public health concern. The millions of Black people who witness police killings, all of us, um, which are experiences public lynchings, suffer PTSD type mental health issues, most negatively impacting our precious children. This is a serious public health concern as well. So to address some ways forward, to advance a holistic and intersectional justice, we need to increase our awareness of the nexus between uh, disability discrimination and racist police terror. A top priority is to insist that public entities spend more on community behavioral health services, mental health, education, housing, and other basic necessities than the inordinate sums they now spend on policing and mass incarceration. This is already happening in Oakland, that transfer of funds, as I mentioned earlier. Also, we must stop relying on police to respond to 911 mental health crises and instead transfer funds to support professionals and community members to respond to these calls in a far safer, a more effective and skillful way. Indeed, the hundreds of hours of police academy training, a minuscule number, is devoted to conflict transformation to de-escalation, to cultivating empathy and relational approaches, to restorative justice. The overwhelming number of hours, of training hours, is of course devoted to how to use force. Let's decriminalize mental health. Let's remove mentally ill per, uh, individuals from over-resourced jails and prisons and transfer uh, them and transfer funds to historically underfunded community-based providers of mental uh, health and behavioral health uh, and wellness services. 
There are a lot of community-based mental health and wellness agencies that are greatly underfunded. Funds taken from police and carceral budgets should be transferred to, the, transferred rather, to them. In Alameda County, where I live, this might include the Center for, for Family Counseling, Families in Transition, Early Childhood Mental Health, Victims of Crime Therapeutic Services, West Oakland Mental Health Center. Funding is also needed uh, to funding is also needed to support broader wellness and prevention strategies that are culturally specific, such as restorative justice for Oakland youths, healing and community building circles for youth, LGBTQ plus elders, women and girls. And, Black men's and reentering citizens circles. These circles are going on now all over Oakland. These circles and ceremonies draw on ancient African healing traditions that are proving effective in addressing racialized trauma and you will experience that you'll have a, a, a taste of these kinds of ceremonies uh, uh, during the drumming and ceremony uh, that will happen at this beautiful uh, Reimagining Mental Health Conference uh, today or later on in the month. We can learn uh, from what worked best in Africa's post-conflict zones. Talk therapy and other Western interventions were unsuccessful, especially with child soldiers, but generally with all of the populations affected. Culturally specific approaches were more effective, including ceremony, ritual, community engagement, and spiritual dimensions, drumming, dancing, music. Since the early 2000s, mental health courts that favor a non-adversarial approach by a judge-led multidisciplinary team are being used to divert mentally ill defendants from incarceration uh, to optimized treatment. Though the preferred strategy, and the restorative strategy, is to decriminalize mental health and shift interventions away from carceral systems to communities altogether, mental health courts are a systems-based based approach that warrants mention and that favors community-based interventions. Funding Black mental health services is a matter of reparations. On a national scale, these decriminalizing um, police defunding and re-envisioning efforts should be folded into and funded by reparations initiatives, whether the national and state reparations legislation or local initiatives underway in more than 225 municipalities throughout the nation. So in conclusion, this is an exciting time of awakening, of repair, and of re-envisioning. In our nation, Black mental health needs need to be reimagined, no less than policing, no less than mass incarceration, in ways where Black lives will matter. There is a critical nexus between Black mental health, mass incarceration, and policing. We simply can't reimagine Black mental health without reimagining mass incarceration and reimagining our criminal injustice system and reimagining public safety. Most important is to decriminalize mental illness in this country, in this country, 
transfer funds from overfunded police and carceral institutions to community-based mental and behavioral health providers and wellness providers offering culturally specific community healing approaches. At the end of the day, we ensure public safety and black mental health by saying no, no, to a way of life that exalts profit, whiteness, extreme individualism, and engenders unfathomable harm to a way of life that heals, a way of life that centers the well being of all human and earth beings and the generations to come. Thank you and, and, and blessings to you. Thank you.